Next up, we have Olivia Ryder. Hi, everyone. Is this on? OK. Sounds like it is. Excellent. Hi, everyone. So my name is Olivia Ryder. I work for a company called Sonoma Technology. But today, I'm, oh, I'm going the wrong way already. There we go. I'm going to be talking a little bit about global warming potential um, and giving you some basic information on what it is and how to think about it. So what we're going to do is, is sort of talk through uh, why do certain gases warm the atmosphere and what is this term radiative heating? You may have heard that before. We'll talk through what it is. What is global warming potential? And then we'll talk about a few different greenhouse gases and how long they stay in the atmosphere because that's actually really important. Ah, so this was the issue with switching from, <laughs> from <laughs> PowerPoint to Google Slides, but it's okay. Uh, so imagine that this blue area is actually across the whole Earth. So that's the atmosphere, so apologies about that. But what happens in, in the, on the planet is that radiation from the sun heats the Earth, and then the heat from the Earth then is radiated back into the atmosphere. And so that heat is then released back to space. And so that's sort of like Michelle was mentioning before. Um, you know, it's like a crocheted blanket, maybe with some holes in that you can stick your finger through. But when we have greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they warm the Earth. And they do that by slowing the rate of that release of heat back into space. And they do that in a couple of different ways. So these are our little CO2 molecules that we have here. And the way that they do this is they absorb that heat that's being released from the Earth. And they then take that heat, they release some of it to space over a longer period of time. But then they also um, move some of, or release some of that heat back towards the Earth. So the takeaways here are that the greenhouse gases interrupt the release of heat from the Earth by absorbing the heat from the Earth then slowly releasing it to space, but also releasing it back towards the Earth, right? So there's this sort of cycle. And that heat that's being released from the Earth is known as, as radiate or radiation, and that's sort of what radiative heating is, as I mentioned I would say that. So let's talk about, well, before I go to that slide, let's go back one slide. So different gases have different rates, they diff have different efficiencies of absorbing radiation and different rates that they release that heat. Um, and so what we need is a way to compare different types of gases um, so that we can sort of understand how efficiently they're holding on to that heat so we can sort of rate them. And so we do that by using this um, term or this value global warming potential. And so what that allows us to do is to compare the impacts of different greenhouse gases. It measures how potent or strongly a gas is at contributing to climate change. And then the term itself, if we sort of go back to what the definition is, is how it's a measure of how much energy one ton of a gas will absorb over a certain amount of time compared to one ton of carbon dioxide. So usually that time period that you'll hear about is 100 years. And so there's this term GWP100, which is the global warming potential for 100 years. So if we distill that down, so the, the TLDR version of this is a larger global warming potential means that there'll be more warming compared to CO2, right? So it might sound a little bit complicated, but let's, let's look at some numbers here. So you've probably heard of carbon dioxide and, and methane, nitrous oxide, like Michelle just mentioned. There's actually 80 different greenhouse gases that are on the list from, um, well, th that are on the list that have this sort of ability to absorb heat and hold on to it and then slowly release it and interrupt the release back to space. So if we sort of think about what, you know, the strength or potency of these are, we're looking at their ability to, to absorb and re-emit or radiate heat. And we're also really interested in how long they last in the atmosphere. These two values are what goes into determining these numbers for global warming potentials. So if we look at the, the little chart that I have here, where I've pulled out maybe five or so uh, greenhouse gases, let's look at sort of how they compare to each other. So carbon dioxide is one. So remember, that's the reference point. So it's always going to be one. So everything's being compared to carbon dioxide. 
we can obviously see that as we go down this list, they're increasing. So we have some CFCs in there. We have some HFCs, which are replacements for CFCs. And then we get all the way to this sulfur hexafluoride. And this is actually the most potent greenhouse gas that exists. So it really spans from one to you know, 23,500. Okay, numbers are great, but what does that actually mean, right? So if we look at methane, it, this means that one ton of methane is actually equivalent to 28 tons of carbon dioxide being released in terms of its ability you know, to hold on to heat and slowly release it. If we look at this, this compound HFC23, now one ton of this is equivalent to 12,400 tons of carbon dioxide, right? So that's a huge, huge difference. Okay, but we're not only interested in how well they hold on to heat. We also want to know how long they last in the atmosphere because that's gonna determine you know, how much of a problem they are, how long we have to deal with them for. So let's sort of think through this. If we look at methane, we're looking at 12 years. So if you release maybe you know, a molecule of methane even, right, a ton of methane, that's gonna be in the atmosphere for 12 years. Carbon dioxide, we know, lasts thousands of years in the atmosphere. Okay, so maybe you would think, okay, methane may be not so bad. But you have to remember it also is 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So there's this sort of balance that we have to, to, to think about here when we think about um, these sorts of gases. So while well, many of the gases um, have a shorter lifetime, so you know maybe 12 years, 100 years, 222 years, they're still many times more potent than carbon dioxide at absorbing heat. So we really need to think about both of these. And then we have species like sulfur hexafluoride, and there's others on the list too. These have both a really large global warming potential, but then they also have a really long lifetime, so 3,200 years. So we really need to be cognizant of not only the species that we're releasing, but their global warming potential, and then also how long they're gonna be lasting in the atmosphere. So just to summarize the points that I made here, um, just as, a, again, a TLDR, you can <laughs> tune back in now. So greenhouse gases interrupt the release of heat from the earth, and they do this in three different ways. They're absorbing the heat from the earth, they're slowly releasing it to space, and then they're releasing that heat back towards the earth again. Global warming potentials are measured of how potent a gas is at contributing to climate change. The larger the value, the more warming it has compared to carbon dioxide. And then lastly, lifetime of gases in the atmosphere, so how long they're around for is really important. And some gases have both a large global warming potential and also a really long lifetime. And that's something really important to keep in mind as well. And so with that, hopefully I've taught you a little bit about global warming potential and I'll pass it back to Michelle. Wonderful, that was awesome, Olivia. I definitely learned a lot as well and Olivia will be one of the booths over there